Welcome to Authors at Google in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Today we welcome author Larry Tai, who will discuss his latest book, Superman, The High-Flying History of America's Most Enduring Hero. Larry runs the Boston-based Health Coverage Fellowship, which is designed to help the media do a better job covering critical health care issues. Each year it trains 10 medical journalists from newspapers, radio stations, and TV outlets from across the country on topics ranging from public health and mental health to insuring the uninsured. From 1986 to 2001, Larry was a beat reporter at the Boston Globe, where his primary beat was medicine. <clears throat> he also served as the Globe's environmental reporter, roving national writer, investigative reporter, and sports writer. And if you look at the Boston Globe archives, you'll see that his byline appeared on over 7,000 articles over 15 years. So I think he probably doesn't have trouble disciplining himself to uh, research and write. He's the author of five previous books, including the 2009 New York Times bestseller, Satchel, The Life and Times <coughs> of an American Legend, which is a biography of two American icons, the uh, great baseball pitcher Satchel Paige and Jim Crow, who was the characterization and personification of the uh, amalgam of racial laws in the South that uh, mandate a separation of races in all public spaces. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Larry Ty. So other than the camera back there, we should make this really informal, small group, and we can make this intimate, and, the, um, and I want to tell you a little bit about what I, why I wrote a book about Superman and what I found, and then you can talk about it, or you can uh, go and enjoy a beautiful day or do whatever you like. So what I want to actually start out is saying, I don't know how much of you know what happens when you kick off a book. But you always dream about something big happening that, the, um, that will lend an event and some publicity and some oomph to getting started with a book. And the, I went to a very strange place. Has anybody ever heard of a town called Metropolis? <laughs> there really is a Metropolis. Anybody know where Metropolis is? It's in Illinois. Anybody ever hear? Nobody's ever heard of Metropolis, Illinois. Well, it's a place so obscure and so unlike the real metropolis that we see in the comic books that um, to get there from Boston, what you have to do is take a plane to O'Hare and then take one of two planes every day that are like power jumpers that go from O'Hare Airport to Paducah, Kentucky. And then when you get to Paducah, Kentucky, you have to hope that somebody is there that will take you 13 miles across the Ohio River to the part of Illinois that is more like the South than anything else in Illinois. And the, I ended up there, um, so this is a town that you get into and you see that not only doesn't it have an airport or a train station, it doesn't have a taxi cab or a rental car company or anything that would give a sense that it was really a metropolis. What it has is a big sign saying it is the official home of Superman. <laughs> and it has, on most weekends when you get there, about 5,000 people. On the weekend that I went here, the reason it was the perfect place to kick off my book was not just because it declares itself the official home of Superman, but because every summer in June, it, that happened to coincide with the actual weekend that my book was planned to come out, it is the home to the Superman Festival where 30,000 people come from across the world to celebrate Superman. So it's like your dream kickoff party. 30,000 of <laughs> Superman's best friends from everywhere are there, along with all the crazy press that cares about comic books and particularly Superman. And so I went there, and I want to just tell you about one thing that happened to me when I was there. I was in a hall about to give, um, be a part of the panel giving a big talk. And the, it was the biggest hall they had in Metropolis, which probably seated 300 people. It was, I guess, a converted some kind of theater. And this hall was about a third full. And I'm there on a panel with two guys who have played Superboy on TV series. And we were enough of a draw to fill up a third of the room. We get five minutes into our talk, and suddenly this guy walks into the room, a white-haired guy with an ancient white-haired lady on his arm looking like if he had let go of her, she might tumble down. And she goes and takes a seat up front, but doesn't say a word. And within about five minutes, between text messages 
and cell phone calls, the hall that was the third full became overflowing. And it was overflowing because this was a woman, anybody ever hear of somebody named Noel Neal? Yeah. yeah, who was Noel Neal? She played Lois Lane in the 50s TV series. She did, for all but one year, for all but the first year of the TV series, she was Lois Lane. There was something even worse in terms of production value before the TV series, there were, you're all much too young to remember something called the movie serials. But the movie serials were these shorts that lasted 15 minutes. And on a Saturday afternoon, most of America, every kid in America wanted to go to the movies. And their parents thought that they were going to the movies to see Pride and Prejudice. Uh -huh. But they were really going there to see the 15 minute Superman serial that preceded Pride and Prejudice. And these were terrible things. They, have you ever heard of the expression cliffhanger? Yeah. Well, cliffhanger came from these movie serials because at the end of every serial, the heroine would be on a railroad track with a train about to run <laughs> her over, and it would end just with the train coming right to her. And it was a cliffhanger because it wanted you to come back the next week for the next episode, of a dozen episodes of the serial, and the best of all the serials was Superman, and Noel Neal was there. There were two people who made my day in Metropolis. One was Noel Neal, and the other one was, I brought you a little picture to show you who my other favorite guy there was in Metropolis. And that's me, and that is the biggest Superman in the world. <laughs> 15 feet high, and it is made of bronze. And this, I don't know if anybody reads ever the Boston Globe, but this picture, this crazy picture, was in the Globe travel section, me describing in the Sunday's Globe, in yesterday's Globe, my trip to Metropolis. And he is made of bronze for one reason. He was initially, Metropolis decided in its three-block long downtown that the only thing the official home of Superman could have, it had to have a big statue of Superman looking down the street towards downtown. The problem with the original statue was that he was made of fiberglass. Now these are people in a town that is very southern, and when Superman is made of fiberglass, everybody in town who has a gun, which was everybody in town, had to see whether Superman was in fact bulletproof. <laughs> and it turned out the fiberglass Superman was not bulletproof. So that became a bulletproof riddled statue of Superman, and this is what we got instead. And this statue has got many attempts to shoot at him, but he's made of bronze and it just bounces right off like it's supposed to. If you ever saw the original TV Superman series, did ever, anybody ever watch in reruns that black and white TV series? Well, there's something very strange that goes on there. And what is strange is Superman is bulletproof and you watch people shooting at him and the bullets bounce off. But when they get frustrated, they throw their gun at him and he ducks. <laughs> <laughs> So what I want to do is take you for a minute from Metropolis to my book. And the obvious question, if you see a book there, and you see somebody who has spent their life being a newspaper reporter and written books about serious topics like racial segregation, is why would you write a book about somebody like Superman? And I wrote the book partly for a very serious reason. I was fascinated, having written books, biographies before, on what I think of as American heroes, and being in the process now of writing a new biography on my hero growing up, who was a guy named Bobby Kennedy, I was intrigued why America embraced the heroes that we do. What is it that the hero tells us about them and about ourselves that we think certain people are heroes? Today, in today's world, politicians last as heroes for about 15 seconds. When Barack Obama ran for senator from Illinois, he posed next to the Superman statue in what may be the most famous picture on the internet of Barack Obama. If you Google, of course Google, the, if you Google Barack Obama and Superman, you will see a picture of him in the statue that became widely circulated during his 2008 campaign for president. But from Bar Barack Obama to um, Michael Jordan to whomever our hero is today, they don't seem to last long. And Superman has lasted for 74 years. And so I thought a good way to look at heroes was to look at the guy who may be the longest, you see, is it there? Yeah. Okay, great, okay. The, um, look at the longest lasting hero of the last century who is Superman. So that was a serious reason for writing this book. 
the real reason, the other and maybe more important reason was I wanted to be 10 years old again. And for the last year, for the last two years, being able to call Superman my work let me be 10 years old. What I want to do, anybody here grow up as a Superman fan? Sort of, sort of. Yeah, that's a, that's a, no, nobody. Well, the, so I also wanted to see what there was to find out about Superman, the serious stuff about the hero part, but also whether there were new things that I could find out that even the most avid Superman fan wouldn't know. And I just came back from a place called Comic-Con. <coughs> Anybody know what Comic-Con is? Comic-Con is in San Diego every year, 150,000 very crazy people <laughs> go to San Diego and the only way I can describe to anybody who hasn't been to Comic-Con what it's like is, if you have ever been in Times Square on New Year's Eve and you see a million people packed sort of cheek by jowl and yet they all look like they're having fun. They, they, for anybody who's claustrophobic you would think it would be a nightmare, but people are having fun. 150,000 fans at Comic-Con for an entire four days look like they are having a blast. 80% of them are dressed up in some crazy costume, and they are, in a San Diego summer, walking around <laughs> with incredible stuff on that must make them feel like it's 200 degrees, but they're having a blast. And I wanted to be able to tell them, even the craziest Superman fans, things about the character that they didn't know. And I want to just tell you a couple of those things that I found out about Superman. One is, his creator, do we know who created Superman? Who wrote the first Superman story? Jerry Siegel, Jerry Siegel. So we've speculated for 74 years what Jerry Siegel was thinking, and he would give short interviews. But in the process of writing this book, I came across Jerry Siegel's unpublished 100-page memoir, where he told us precisely what he was thinking, why he created the character. And the reason he created the character is because Jerry Siegel, when he was growing up in a section of Cleveland, Ohio, called Glenville, a section that was very poor, and 95% Jewish. Jerry Siegel was a little bit too short and a little bit too round and wore glasses that were a little bit too thick. And every day when he would go to school, and particularly when he'd go out on the playground at recess time, kids would taunt him. He was, in the classic sense, a kid who was bullied. And they'd come up to him and they'd say, Siegel, Siegel, birds of an eagle. Now, I have no idea what that means, other than that if you're a 15-year-old or a 12-year-old kid, you wish you could fly away, because everybody's watching, and particularly all the girls that were watching him, and he was incredibly embarrassed. And so every night when he would go to bed, he would take a pad of paper and a pencil, and he would draw a world, an imaginal world, that would take him away from his real world of being bullied. And he created a character to start with, that was called the super hyphen man. And this was a character who was a really bad guy who wanted to take over the world the way that Jerry wished that he could have done and basically, you know, pummel all of his kids who were bullying him every day. And that was sort of every kid's reaction, a normal reaction is you want to be stronger than everybody else and do them harm if that's what it takes to sort of to, to get free of that bullying. And that was the way the character looked until, at age 17, something traumatic happened to Jerry Siegel. And his dad owned a used clothing store in a part of, of Cleveland that was sort of a rough neighborhood. And one day, three guys come into that clothing store, and they try on a suit, and they walk out without paying. And Michael Siegel starts to go after them, and on the spot, he has a massive heart attack, and he basically drops dead. And at age, seven, at age 17, this kid, Jerry, who is the youngest of six siblings of Lithuanian Jewish immigrant parents, is suddenly bereft. He has lost his dad. He has lost his hero. And shortly after that, when he goes to bed at night with his pad of paper and his pencil, the character of Superman is transformed. He drops the the. He drops the hyphen. And he drops the bad guy hat. And in the story that Jerry Siegel writes, the first story he writes of this new Superman character, he runs over the next morning after finishing his story to his buddy and his neighbor, Joe Schuster's home. And Joe Schuster is an artist teenage nerd. 
And Joe Schuster, in his first rendition of the Superman character, draws a guy who is speeding in to save a man who is being robbed, who looks suspiciously like Michael Siegel. So what Superman really is, from the very beginning, is a story of a little boy fighting back against a world that seems kind of cruel to him. Only something magical happens. At the moment that Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster develop their character, America is at a moment when it needs a hero maybe more than it ever has in its history. We are in 1938 when the first Superman story comes out. We're in the middle of what? Depression. The Great Depression. Yeah, we're now in the middle of a some other depression, but this was the Great Depression, the one that seemed to last forever. We're also on the eve of being dragged into a war in Europe. And we're basically a country that's not quite sure where we're going. And we need a hero, and Jerry, Jerry Schuster, uh, Joe Schuster and Jerry Siegel give us a hero in a magical moment that guarantees that starting from that very first issue in June 1938, basically every time Superman was on the cover of DC Comics, he sold out. And he sold out in numbers in hundreds of thousands and close to a million numbers that comic books had never seen happen. They were a new medium, and this was unheard of. So the first story I wanted to tell you about Superman is that it all starts like everything with a really human scale story, and in this case, a bullied boy named Jerry. The other story I want to tell you about Superman, anybody have any idea what religion Superman is? Why would Superman have a religion? How would we even know about his religion? Well, I want to tell you that every religion out there has embraced Superman as theirs. Christians see Superman as the perfect Christ story. God sends his only son to earth to show mankind that it can be better than it, than it thought it could be and to raise the standards and raise the hope of mankind. Buddhists see Superman as the perfect Zen character. Who could be more Zen than Superman who knows right from wrong and just doesn't even have to think about any of this? Atheists and agnostics see Superman as a secular messiah. Who needs religion? Superman knows right from wrong, and it's not about religion. But I am here to tell you what Superman's real religion is, and Superman is Jewish. And I want to tell you why I think Superman is Jewish. Anybody know what Superman's name was when he came down from Krypton? Kal-El. Anybody speak Hebrew here? A little bit? What does El mean? Do we know what El means? Oh, El means God. Kal means, Kal-El suggests the vessel or voice of God. Accidental, maybe. I don't think anything is accidental. When you grow up in a world that's 95% Jewish, and all of this is part of what Jerry Siegel told us in his memoir that he was doing, which is writing about what he knows, I don't think it's an accident. But if that was an accident, as much as Superman might look like the Christ story, there's a better story, but there's an even more compelling metaphor that I think Superman is playing out. And this is a story of parents trying to save their child by floating him out to space or to a river, and he is adopted by two of the most extraordinary Gentiles that the world has ever seen, which are John and Martha Kent in the middle of Kansas. And they raise the child as their own and suddenly discover this child is really somebody exceptional. Now, that's not the story of Moses and Exodus, and I don't know what the story of Exodus is. There are, in my book, I go through 20 other pieces of little hints that Jerry and Joe left us. But to me, the most fun is any name that ends in the word M-A-N, man, is one of two things. It is either a superhero or a Jew, or in this case, both. So it's not Superman, it's Superman. <laughs> so one more thing I really want to tell you here now, which is the question that I started the whole book process with, which is what is Superman? Is there a serious story in Superman? Anybody who spends a year or two writing a biography, and any publisher that's going to publish a biography, a serious publisher like Random House, publishes it only if the book is a lens into something bigger than just the story of a comic book character. And to me, I think there are two reasons that we can learn from as to why Superman has survived for nearly 75 years. Next summer, you will be bombarded with Superman stuff. There will be a movie out and there will be a million celebrations of Superman's 75th birthday. 
and everybody will be asking, how has he managed to last so long when our heroes today disappear in 15 minutes? And I think there are two reasons that he has. One is that he has evolved more than the fruit fly, that every generation has gotten a Superman that is specific to what their particular needs and aspirations are. In the 1930s, we were a country in the 1930s, we were, a country, we were a country on the eve of war and in the middle of the Depression, and we got a Superman who was the consummate New Deal liberal. He was going out trying to chase down slum lords and wife beaters, and he never told us how he voted, but we all knew he voted <laughs> for Franklin Roosevelt and the whole idea of social change in America, because that was what we needed then. In the 1940s, when we were going to war, we needed a different kind of hero. And Superman took us to war in a very interesting way. You remember, anybody remember whether Superman ever actually went to war? Well, DC Comics was really worried about that. They were worried that if they sent Superman off to war, that people would say he could win the war in 15 minutes. He'd just take over and he'd crush the Nazis and he'd win the war. And that would be disparaging the efforts of our real soldiers who were going over and being wounded and killed overseas. So what they did in a brilliant comic book was they had Clark Kent go in and do his induction exam. And we all know that every induction exam, you have to read an eye chart. And he was looking at the eye chart, only instead of reading that eye chart, he was reading an eye chart two examining rooms in, because he had x-ray vision. <laughs> and he failed his eye test. And this was a particularly compelling explanation for Joe Schuster, who had terrible eyesight and who was drawing Superman. He failed his eye test, and that meant that he had to stay home. And what he ended up doing, Superman, throughout the war years, was he ended up chasing down saboteurs and protecting us on the home front. And for the government, any time they did a war bond drive or were trying to collect medals or newspapers or anything precious to the war effort, Superman was out there on their posters as the centerpiece of their drive. Every ration kit that went overseas to one of our troops included a comic book. And most of the time, it was a Superman comic book. So he was out there making soldiers feel like there was still a little escape from their horrible world, and they could read about Superman. He was making people at home feel patriotic in buying their war bonds. And he was giving America precisely the hero that we needed in the 1940s. In the 1950s, what was our preoccupation? Communism. Communism, the Red Menace. Superman was out there chasing down the Red Menace. In the 1960s, when we were exploring all kinds of new avenues, Superman, for part of that time, was consciously divorced from that. There was a guy named Mort Weisinger, who in the 1960s created what were known as imaginary stories, as if Superman, in concept, wasn't himself an imaginary story. And Superman would get married, or he'd die, or he'd do all of these things, and at the end of the comic book, they would say, oh, by the way, this was an imaginary story. And it probably didn't happen. And mm -hmm. next comic book, he won't be married again. In the 1970s and 80s and 90s, he continued to do that. He continued to give us precisely what we needed for that era. So part of the reason I think he survived forever is that he evolved and he changed with our times. The other reason is precisely the opposite, is that the most important core elements of Superman maintain themselves throughout all of this time and through all those changes. And that was, most importantly, the Dudley Do-Right guy who knows exactly the difference between right and wrong and never wavers in his choice. The world had lots of dark heroes like Batman. The world had lots of fraught and anxious heroes like Spider-Man. But there was one guy who was always out there when we needed some sense of right and wrong, Superman was out there. And as clunky as that might have seemed, it also, to kids and their parents and their grandparents, that seemed familiar enough that Superman was always there as the touchstone for a certain kind of righteous hero in America. And I think those two capacities put together are what gave us a character that has survived for nearly 75 years and that the lawyers and the heirs to Superman who are doing battle over his rights right now, don't screw it up. He'll be around for another 75 years. What I think I would like to do there is actually stop and see if we wanted to uh, questions, discussion, or anything. 
Yeah. So you mentioned that we're coming up on the 75th anniversary. Um, what was the timing of this book? Was, why not wait a little longer so you really can pick up on that, uh, on the rush there? Uh, for me, the timing of it? Oh, it was two things. One is, um, I'll be candid with you, that the, uh, the timing is partly that the movie was due out this summer, and I thought it was brilliant timing that we'd have it just when the movie was coming out. And you, imagine if you had a history of Batman out at this moment, you would be there interviewed by a million people. Um, well, in fact, it turned out to be kind of brilliant timing, accidental, that this is the summer of the superhero in America. We had the Avengers, we had Batman, we had Spider-Man, and we even had an animated Superman called Superman versus the Elite. So the timing has been great, and your dream as an author, there are certain touchstones today in the world minus Oprah's book club. There are the biggest thing that you can have happen. It used to be that if you were on Oprah, the next day every bookstore in America would sell out because she said buy the book. In an Oprah-less world, the, what you want to do is, the New York Times is the touchstone in terms of newspapers, and this was um, the cover review a few weeks ago in the New York Times, and I'm convinced it was partly to do with the fact that this is the summer of a superhero, and it was also to do with the fact that when they looked through all the reviews that they could put on a cover, who could be a more compelling visual image than they, they had this brilliant drawing of Superman you know, flying across the cover of the book review. So the timing was, <clears throat> turned out to be good for lots of reasons. The other golden thing, um, if you want to sell a book, is there is one person, radio, it turns out, sells books better than any media. And there is one person in radio, I don't know if anybody here is an NPR person, <laughs> but Terry Gross is the closest thing to Oprah. And when, if you are, can I use the word Amazon in here? Google World, If you are number 20,000 on Amazon's bestseller list before Terry Gross airs your interview, we watched my book became one of what Amazon called their 10 movers and shakers, meaning in the course of a day, it moved more numbers up the list, and it was just because of Terry Gross. But the other thing that I realized is, if the book had come out next summer on the 75th anniversary, I guarantee you that there are 10 other books in the works on Superman time for his 75th. So you actually want to be the definitive one that was out before, and then your paperback comes out a year later, and the paperback will come out just at the time for that. But the um, but I actually at the end of this have a have a question for all of you Google experts on books. But the anything else on um, Superman? I'm curious um, if if uh, Cavalier and Clay and Michael Chabon's sort of loosely inspired by Simon Schuster was was something that. Um, is, is in here or something that you looked at? Was, was like somebody that you talked to about? Yes, so if you haven't, if you don't know who Michael Chabon is, there's only one thing you should know about Michael Chabon. There's only one book, he, he's written a lot of good books, but there's only one book that rises above everything, and that is Cavalier and Clay. And that is a book about two fictional comic book creators that, as you say, is really Jerry uh, Siegel and Joe Schuster. And it is a book that is so good that the nicest thing I could ever say about a book is when I got near the end, I would ration myself a certain number of pages to read every night because I didn't want the book to end. Mm -hmm. It was really brilliant. And so my goal was to write a book in nonfiction that drew on the same rich story that he did in fiction. And one of the, they call these things in the back of the book blurbs. And the guy who was the executive producer of all the big Batman movies and had taught the first course ever in comic books, said a nice thing, which is not true, but a nice thing. He said, if you like reading The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, wait till you read Larry Ty's true story behind it all. But that's sort of the dream kind of thing that you want somebody, because this was a book that was really brilliant. But the great thing that I found out was that the only thing better than writing brilliant fiction is to find a nonfiction story that's so good that it reads like fiction. In Jerry and Joe's story and Superman's story, if you can't write a good nonfiction book about that, then shame on you because the story is incredibly rich in the 75 years of it. So were you a Superman fan? Um, so I grew up as a, um, so there are a million different incarnations of Superman. There are all the various incarnations in the comic books depending on who was writing it or who was drawing it. There are the various TV shows. 
there are, you know, I didn't know until I started writing this book, I'm embarrassed to say, about this whole generation that had grown up with Smallville as their version of who Superman was, you know, the, the um, uh, Superman coming of age story that's made it through nine seasons of television. Um, I grew up as a Superman fan starting with the TV series. And in the 1950s TV series, if you could believe that this was uh, a Superman that was played by a guy named George Reeves, who in his incarnation as Superman looked exactly like his incarnation as Clark Kent minus the glasses, who acted, who had no clue how to change his persona, how to change his voice. His flying was jumping off a trampoline through a window and then having a crane hold him up in the air. And it looked about as much like flying as if somebody held me up in the air and, and you whooshed by with a lot of fans blowing and tried to make a book. And yet I believed he was Superman because I wanted to believe, I wanted the character to be real. And I was 10 years old. And Yes, I was a fan, and I was a fan, I'm saying, back in the days when Superman was so crude that if you were willing to buy into it all, it had to be a pretty good story. By the 1970s, people remember Christopher Reeve and those uh, Superman movies. By the 1970s, their motto, their marketing line, when they were marketing those four Christopher Reeve movies was, you will believe a man can fly. And you did believe it. And by the time we get to 2013 Man of Steel story, in the, in the um, short, the 30-second blurb that we saw in the Batman movie, it looked like he was flying to me. I mean, it just, it really, now you can do a million things. But in those early days, it was a story that kept us riveted because all the technology looked so miserable. <laughs> yes, I grew up as a fan, um, and I grew up even more just fascinated by the, the only two symbols of American popular culture that you can go anywhere in the world today and not have to tell people who they are. There are only two of them. And one is obviously, I think, Superman, and the other one is... McDonald's? Uh, say again, McDonald's? No, that's good. McDonald's, good. but not popular culture. The, those, are, those are products, popular culture figures. Who else in popular culture? Mickey Mouse? Mickey Mouse, exactly. Sadly, it is Mickey Mouse, and I think that the... Um, you know, I thought when I was out posting ads on the Superman sites, asking people when I started the book to send me their Superman stories, I thought I'd hear from people across America. I heard from people in Paris and Buenos Aires and across Asia and Africa and the, I didn't realize until I started doing my research that even in the earliest days he was translated into more than 50 languages, you know, by the 1940s and 50s. And today, the guy who made Superman fly in the Christopher Reeve movies was a guy who grew up in Serbia, reading comic books, Superman comic books translated into Serbian. And that's how he became a fan and came here and made Superman fly. It just, it's such a compelling story that it works everywhere. You're so can you tell how Superman um, appears in the series of superhero that characterizes comics? Is it, you know, what was before and what happened after? Um, Good question. Before was, Superman was based on things that go back as far as Hercules and Samson. And more immediately, he was based on characters that probably none of you have ever heard of called Doc Savage. You ever heard of Doc Savage? Sure. Yeah. Well, so Doc Savage had everything from a fortress of solitude that he escaped to. Doc Savage didn't like women. Doc Savage had a nickname called the Man of Bronze, and Superman was the Man of Steel. He came from a lot of characters that Jerry was reading in those days. Doc Savage was one, the Phantom was another, the Shadow was another. These were early characters that were not comic books because we didn't have comic books then. They were comic strips. The big thing was newspaper comic strips and that's what Jerry and Joe wrote Superman to be. Only they were just starting this new medium of having original stories appear in booklet form and he was, it was on his back, his muscle bound back, that comic books as a medium and the whole superhero idea really took off. And today, nobody reads, we, we just had a movie that was modestly successful based on one of the Superman um, models, which was John Carter of Mars. Did anybody see that movie? Yeah. I mean, basically, um, most of those other guys aren't around today. And there's something magical about the fact that Superman still is. And that his brother at DC Comics, Batman, who came out a year later, and Jerry thought it was a 
clear ripoff of the whole Superman idea. And Spider-Man, who was the a guy, so it was one of the other Jewish elements of the Superman story is that all the early comic book creators, from Jerry and Joe to the people who created Batman to the Spider-Man creator, were all Jews. And they were all Jews for a very simple reason. That in those days, in the 1930s and early 40s, smart Jewish kids who had thought about going into a world as a writer, they couldn't get hired because of anti-Semitism in the big magazines. They couldn't get hired at the big ad agencies. And so what they did was they went to work doing the lowest grade and the lowest paying to start with of all the medium, which was comic books. And a guy named Stanley Lieber, a smart Jewish kid from New York, from the same high school that half of these kids came from, decided that he was someday going to write the great American novel. And he was going to write that under his real name, Stanley Lieber. But in the meantime, he had to earn a buck. And so he would change his name to Stan Lee. And he would go out there, and for a year or two, he'd write comic books. Well, he's still writing comic books 50 years later. And nobody knows that he's called Stanley Lieber. And he never wrote the great American novel. But he wrote the perfect, I, I had two fun interviews with Stan Lee, um, with him initially denying that that Spider-Man had anything to do with Superman, and finally admitting this was the anti-Superman. Superman was the, the guy who knew instinctively right from wrong, and Spider-Man was the guy who had to sit there and worry about what's right, what's wrong, who do I come from, where, what's going on. And unlike Batman or Spider-Man or most of our heroes, there's something about Superman that in his basic story is incredibly different. And that is that the real character in Spider-Man is Peter Parker. The real character in Batman is Bruce Wayne. The real character in Superman is Superman. And his disguise is Clark Kent. And what I think that was all about was that the real character came from Krypton. And he had to be Superman. And that was who he was. And that was what he was comfortable as. But he was trying to understand this new alien world mankind that he had dropped into. And his way of reaching out to mankind was to take on the identity of a real person. And the identity that he picked, they, everybody developed a million explanations for why he was a reporter. And that was because he could be out there where news was happening, where damsels needed rescuing, wherever it was. I think that's all garbage. I think the real reason was Jerry Siegel had dreamed about being a reporter in his earliest days. And it all goes back to that little boy and what he wanted to do. He dreamed about it, so he made his hero a reporter in the real world. And what he was doing is, Jerry and Joe both said that when they were trying to envision what Superman looked like, they would look in front of the mirror. And they believed that for anybody who was smart enough, if they looked into them, they wouldn't see the schlubby Clark Kent exterior. They would see into their soul and see that they were really Superman in disguise. And that's something we could all relate to. I mean, I hope when you look at me up here, you don't see the the uh, balding, aging guy. You know, with I, you look and you see I'm a Superman, and we all dream of that. And I think that's one of the elemental reasons why Superman is still going 74 years later. So you hinted at it, but there. I remember Tarantino, I think, had the whole dialogue, the, the whole monologue, which was, you know, Superman is uh, Superman. Clark Kent is Superman's uh, comment on mankind. But he goes a step further to say, you know, he, Clark Kent is weak. He is, you know, he is a, a coward. He is, you know, all these negative things. And yeah. that is, uh, I mean, do you see any of that in the, in kind of Jerry's, um, what he's love, trying to project on that? I love Quentin Tarantino, but I think that the, um, and I think that Jerry was clearly trying to give Superman certain, I mean, give Clark Kent certain obvious weaknesses. But I also think that key was not who Clark Kent was as an exterior, it was who he was inside. And what Jerry was telling us is that we had to be smarter than Quentin Tarantino and look beyond that. And so I spent endless time, probably crazy wasted time, but it was fun, watching every movie that Superman was ever mentioned in and watching every episode of Seinfeld because Jerry Seinfeld was obsessed with Superman. That was his Know, ultimate hero, and the and I now know more about that trivia. And if I'm ever playing a trivial pursuits <laughs> game, I'll win hands down. But that's about all it's useful for. But the 
it really is interesting. Everybody, I was more interested in why Quentin Tarantino cared about Superman at all. And so I tried to interview as many famous people. I was also intrigued by Superman was, over time, about the most white bread comic book character ever. And the, he was the last of the characters, and his was the last of the books, to try to have any diversity in his comic book. And I was intrigued by talking to people like Henry Louis Gates, Skip Gates, and, and Al Roker, and lots of prominent African Americans about why they grow, grew up as passionate Superman people. And it was intriguing. The answers were pretty consistently. Number one, most of the heroes, when these guys were growing up, were pretty white bread. And number two is, they looked at him as not as this white guy that um, I might have looked at him as. They looked at him as an alien, an outsider, and somebody that they could relate to in terms of their feelings of belonging and not belonging. And people had came up with the smartest answers. I mean, I wish I could have written an entire book just about interesting Superman fans, interesting answers on why they were fans. And, and some of them made me cry when I would hear people you know, talk about how a kid, a, um, a Latino guy um, who grew up with, as he said, no male role model, all the men had disappeared from his life, and trying to sort of A, survive and B, thrive in a ghetto that he grew up in, and said Superman was his male role model. And it just, I mean, people have weird relationships to their heroes, and it's more than just sort of a distraction for a lot of people. So I grew up um, really touched by it all. And what I should do is actually, um, if you have any more questions, um, the, it's not, we should probably end this with my being able to ask all of you a question. And my question is, the, so one of the things that every author is perplexed by, one of the things Jonathan and I, and I were talking about, when you sell a book these days, I don't know if any of you know what it takes to sell a book to a publisher, but it used to be when I started writing books 10 or 12 years ago, you would go to New York, which is where most of the publishers are, and your agent would set up meetings, and you'd sit in a room with you and a couple smart editors talking about the substance of the book and what would the book look like and when could you deliver it and all of this stuff. Today, when you go and try to sell a book, you sit in a room with 10 or 12 people, and at best half of them, and sometimes less, are actually people who have anything to do with the substance of the book, and the rest are who? Who would you think the rest of them are? Venture capitals. Um, good guess. They're the book publishing wor uh, version of venture capitals. They're marketing people, and they want to see not can you write a good book, but can you go out and sell it? Can you talk on Terry Gross and on Oprah and can you talk to newspaper reporters so they can write a compelling story? And they really want to see that you know how to sell a book. Well, that's interesting, and that sort of makes sense, because most books don't even earn back the advance that you're paid in writing it. So they want to see if they get, can get a little bit ahead of that curve. But the truth is, they have no idea at publishing houses how to sell books. And they have now at Random House, and my publisher is the biggest trade press in America. Random House owns lots of other presses, and they're owned by a big company called Bertelsmann in Europe. And they have a, a department now called social media. Say, uh, social media is part of their marketing department. They have no clue what they're doing with any of this stuff. All they know is they'll ask you, do you have Twitter account? And do you have <laughs> blah, blah, And they have really no idea. And you can set up a website. What I want to know is I'm intrigued by, so every night I get a, my Google alert on anywhere my book has been mentioned in the 24 hours since then. And it will tell me all these obscure websites that have said something about it. But is there, if you were me, and the, my editor is the smartest published, the smartest marketing person I've ever met at a publishing house, and what he says is, the way you sell a book is you create buzz. And he says, none of us have any clue how to create buzz, so therefore you try everything. You try old-fashioned media like the New York Times, and you try radio, and you try TV, and you try a million crazy websites that are out there talking perpetually about comic books and about Superman. But the thing that matters the most in any of this is your Google world. How would, is there something that you would recommend to an author like me that you do in terms of making Google um, somehow pay more attention when anybody asks about Superman to my Superman version? Or what would you, what would you do if you were all 
writing in your other life when you, when you leave here, at whatever time you leave here, and you were writing your great American novel, and you had it out there and you were trying to sell it, what would you do in terms of taking all the knowledge you have about how this world of social media works and use it to try to get people to pay attention to your little thing, your book? Could you get involved in some crazy scandal? That's brilliant. You know, that is brilliant. My first book ever was a biography of a man named Edward L. Bernays. And his moniker when he died in the New York Times ran a full page, um, a full page uh, obituary on him. Nobody's probably ever heard of Edward L. Bernays. Well, he was called the father of public relations. He was Sigmund Freud's double nephew, brother and sister married brother and sister, and so and he took his favorite uncle's ideas and why people behave the way they do and used it on behalf of everybody from General Electric and General Motors to presidential candidates to lots of other people. And he said, it doesn't matter what they say about you as long as they spell your name right. <laughs> he would try to tie himself into a scandal or into good news or whatever it was. But short of creating a scandal, you know, whether they, uh, the Batman film producers were, um, doing a million, you know, we feel terribles about the horrible thing that happened in Colorado the weekend that Batman came out. And yet, you look a week later and you see it was the second biggest selling movie in the history of movies that weekend. And being linked to that scandal, which I thought could kill the movie, in fact, everybody in America was talking on the talk shows and everywhere else about Batman and everybody had to go see what the talk was all about. And I think one of the factors, aside from good marketing and doing it, was being tied to a horrible tragedy. But what would you do, seriously, out there? You're, you're um, all these brilliant Google people. What, what do you do? Seriously, I, I, I think probably none of us actually work on search. We're here, but I, from what I know about search, I think the canonical answer is you can't. There, there's, yeah, there's not the canonical. But that's organic buzz, okay. right? Like, so you're saying other, if enough links to your website or whatever, that's, 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 that's how Google works. That's, 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 but what, I'm sorry, let me, let me rephrase my question. Using not just as your Google hack, but you're being smart people who are out there in this new world of social media. You should all be telling Random House, social media department, what to do. What would you do in terms of just generally trying to Gin up some interest in Superman. Send a good idea here. So, <laughs> so, yeah. So, I'm actually in my free time trying to write a book about angels and demons battling and stuff. Um, and my thought was it would be really cool and probably relatively cheap to have, like, um, I'm kind of going down the YouTube route. Like, if you had Superman fly in from, like, the top of a building or something and start handing out like discounts for books at the store. <laughs> There'd probably be a lot of people like filming that with their phone and like you could actually put some press around it and like the local news would probably pick it up. Um, but that would be interesting like. So create something that's so compelling. Yeah. That's cool, cool enough that, that cool enough. Well, it gets viral and like sure. people start talking about yeah. it but then great, yeah. you gotta tie it into the book somehow like they and then maybe you get like a the local news interview or something like that. See, but what if I was smart, I would have taken that idea and done it in Metropolis, Illinois, which yeah. is guaranteed to do the... Uh, like some big uh, bang, though, like yeah. something that draws a lot of attention to Superman, and then they start hearing about the book. Getting a 17-foot Superman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, uh, well, I mean, that's, that's uh, I, I would go slightly, uh, I would send a copy of your book mm. to everyone who writes a blog on Superman. And there are a thousand. So one of the things that my smart editor who said create buzz, he said he would, as many names as I could give him, he would send the book out to. So everybody, every blogger and every every website person has gotten one already, and they've been extraordinarily helpful in doing it. Um, and we sent the day after, we knew that the New York Times cover review was gonna come out, and we knew that the one thing that everybody in old fashioned media like television does is they read the Sunday New York Times, that's sort of guaranteed. And so we had waiting on everybody from John Stewart to um, Jay Leno and Letterman and everybody's desk sort of the next day a copy of that. We've done everything, but but there are a million other things and I don't know what those things are and I just and nobody seems to know um, so, 
how to make it work. The thing that I feel like is a common denominator of the people who use social media really effectively is that they do stuff that's intrinsically interesting. And I'll, I'll give you a, like, if I follow somebody on Twitter and there are, you know, like every tweet is like, buy my new book, buy my new book, buy my new book, I probably unfollow them, even if they may be an author who I really like and respect. But if it's somebody who actually creates a lot of interesting additional content, uh, there's, there's an author, Maureen Johnson, I, I think her Twitter is, is doing pretty well. And I wind up buying her books I, 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 largely because I find her Twitter feed so consistently entertaining, almost more entertaining than the books themselves. Yes, that, that's a great idea. And one of the things that I'm doing is using a very old-fashioned form of media, which is newspapers. Um, Somebody need the room at the... So one of the things, the, if you're ever, when you get your book done on Angels and Demons, one of the things to realize, old-fashioned media um, can be exploited in a brilliant way today, which is that um, everybody knows what the op-ed page is on the newspaper, um, where all the columns are. And that uh, op-ed, like, Op-ed pages, like most parts of newspapers, are actually being read today by more eyeballs than ever in history. They're just not being paid for because so many people are reading it online. But because newspapers are doing terribly in terms of their economics, um, and therefore they can't, most op-ed pages can't afford to pay for people to write for them anymore. Everybody who's writing for them these days are people like authors who are trying to have got something they're up here trying to promote. And so I've written, every city I go to, <laughs> the publisher sends me, I write an op-ed. The Boston Globe ran a Superman op-ed stripped across your page with a brilliant graphic that ensured that if for no other reason than this brilliant picture, people are going to be reading it. And you're writing about everything that happens in the world, you're making hopefully a subtle link saying that all these success of all these movies this summer, Superman speaks to why those why the Avengers was a big success on you. You're trying to do all these things. And I want to make one comment to you, by the way. If you're writing that book and you're, you seriously want to do it, hook up before the book is done. It's going to be a nonfiction or a fiction? Fiction. Fiction, yes. Show it to get an agent. Boston has a lot of great book agents, more than any city in America beyond New York and maybe LA. Boston has a lot of them. Before you get done with it, you want to entice an agent and a publisher into something so that they think, however much they're deceiving themselves, that they're part of shaping a book. They love to think that. <laughs> and Angels and Demons is a hot topic. So get think beyond just what you're writing now to, if you do want to sell this book someday, do you want to sell the book someday? Yeah. <laughs> we'll get published, but... Great, well you'd like to get it published. So just get somebody involved with it. Angels and Demons is hot. Make them see that you get this. And you got 50 pages or 25 pages. You Pretty much just... written them, kind of editing. <laughs> then don't let them know that it's all written yet. Okay. <laughs> Just show it to them. And whether or not they become part of shaping it, psychologically seeing it before it's done is important. And, the, and you've got enough to show. Make sure the, the pages that you show them, somebody will only read. You have to write the most brilliant five-paragraph email that you've ever done in your life to these agents to get them interested enough to read the first five or ten pages of the book. You want to sort of entice them, and you all understand. You understand that people will only read. You know, you want to take them to each level. So have them write a brilliant email to them, and then send them the best five or ten pages, and then sit down and have lunch with them, and pick an agent that you think gets what you're trying to do, and do that soon. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you. Were. Um, if you have any chapters for this book you haven't that you haven't put in, it, any ones that any that fell on the cutting room floor, ah, that's a great idea. On your website. That's a great idea. And there are always, when you go out and do a book tour, so I, I did, my first book talk on this book was at the Boston Public Library, and there was a guy who came into this book talk, sitting in the back of the room, and at the end, when you're sort of done with questions, he raises his hand and he says, well, I don't have a question, I've got a story I'd like to tell. And this guy tells the story that, is a, that when he was um, growing up in New Jersey, one day, his dad is walking down the street in whatever his hometown was, and Joe Schuster comes up and taps the dad on the shoulder and says, excuse me, but you are my image of what Superman ought to look like. And this is 20 years after he wrote, drew the first Superman. He said, can I do a pencil drawing of you? 
So the guy then takes out of his knapsack at the Boston Public Library two pencil drawings that are the absolute spitting image of the original Joe Schuster Superman. And he says, it's the first time I've ever taken these out of my house, and I thought they might be interesting. Well, those two pencil drawings, the, if you have a copy, and I'm talking a copy of an issue that 200,000 of which were printed, of the first Superman comic book, that has sold for more than a million dollars. This guy's pencil drawings are easily worth many millions of dollars, and this guy bringing them up for the first time. So you say, write a chapter. I'd love to tell all these stories about sort of what happens to you as you're going along, and those are legitimate something, and I've got to find a, a blog or somewhere that will sort of get them. Look, you've been great. Somebody else gets this room. Uh, thank you very much for coming. And if you want the book signed, you can do that as well.